history. In the show, I play a fearless leader, Principal Mr. Peck. Before we begin, I'd like to thank all the volunteers who helped with the show, I'd and I'd like to especially thank our teachers, Mr. Rosenquist, Mrs. Oliver, and our director, Mr. Nelson. The first grade classes have worked very hard in this production. To date, they've had 2,000 rehearsals for over 100,000 hours of practice beginning last September. Now, before we begin, I'd like to remind you to turn off all cell phones, pagers, and crying babies. Sit back and enjoy the show. They were comfortable and kept the family warm and safe during the winter, something that is very important in the Northwest. And another thing, don't call them Indians. <laughs> the Northwest Native Americans were called by their tribe names like Chinook, Clatsaw, Tillamook, and Multnomah. Well, I can draw a buffalo. The Native American living on the Oregon coast didn't have buffalo. They became very wealthy fishing for salmon and smelt. For them, nature was totally connected, and they made sure they, they did not overfish or harm the environment around them. They lived in harmony with nature for thousands of years. They often made up stories or legends about nature. The raven, the eagle, the salmon, and the hawk were all very important. Everything was connected, like a circle. A perfect circle has a no beginning or end. That that's, why they, that's why they call it the circle of life.
few weeks later, one of the teams presented a scary pirate potlatch. Today, our team consisting of Bailey, Owen, Laura, and Genevieve is going to present a skit about a potlatch. Before they begin, who can tell me something about a potlatch? Yvonne? Was it in the ceremony that the Costa Native Americans performed? That's right. And why did they do it? Andrew? Uh, the purpose was for the chief or an important person to give away all that he had. The chief became much greater if he gave away everything. Yes, Ruby? Why would the chief give away everything? Then he wouldn't have anything. Well, let's watch and see if we can figure it out. My friends, it is an honor for me to be here and a great honor for me to call this potlatch. The purpose of the potlatch is for the person giving the potlatch to give away everything that he has. That way he will receive a gift greater than any possession. He will receive honor and respect. Hunting Bear, will you come here? Yes, Chief. Hunting Bear, this is a great spear to catch salmon. It was given to me at a potlatch like this by our long departed chief. It was given to him by his father, who is a great fisher of salmon. You shall have it and hunt with it. Thank you, Chief. I'm very honored. Bird Woman, this is a basket that my mother gave to me. It is good for gathering the berries that grow by our shores. I want you to have it. Thank you, Chief. And so in this way, the Chief gave away everything that he owned and, and made everybody feel good. And he... He received the best gift of all, with respect of his tribe. Even though I have no possessions, I am now the richest man in the tribe, because I have honor and respect. Chief has come today to give all he has away, and this is the way correct to earn honor and respect. Yes, I know it's hard to believe, and it's better to give than receive. Yes, I know it's hard to believe, and it's better to give than receive. So people, don't be greedy. Sure to help the needy and do what is right and fair and give because you care. Yes, I know it's hard to believe that it's better than give and receive. Yes, I know it's hard to believe that it's better than give and receive. Yes, I know it's hard to believe that it's better than give and receive. for about a third of what now is the United States. The ruler of France at the time was a sort of little guy named Napoleon, and he had a big problem. He was out of cash. Savannah, Sarah, and Blythe and Reem will now perform this get about Lacout and Napoleon. And now 
Last in the Emperor of France, Emperor, Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte.
the Honorable Thomas Jefferson. Mr. President, I have very interesting news. According to our spies, Napoleon has broken the French baby willing to sell Louisiana. So that's why the ambassador wants to see me. What do you think this land is worth? Well, it is estimated that it is 600 million acres. At one dollar an acre, that would make the land worth at least 600 million dollars. Well, that is a lot of money. I don't know if we can afford it, but stay. Let's listen to what the ambassador has to say. Mr. Wilbur, will you please show the ambassador in? Certainly, Mr. President. Mr. President, announcing the ambassador from France. Mr. Lebrook. Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning, security guys. And I shall go right to the point. The government of France would like to sell America the land we call Louisiana. We asked you to pay us $15 million. Hmm, $15 million? <coughs> and we were going to pay $600 million. Well, take it. <laughs> What, Galton? But now I must find to explore this land. Well, I suggest that you order a unit of army that is good in, and someone who is good at surviving in the wilderness. Yes, Galton, that is true. You know, I think I have someone in mind. Who is that? In a plantation near to us in Virginia, who is a very noble captain, Mary Lanvey Lewis. He's one of the best men I've ever encountered, and his skills in the woods are better than any man I know. Yes, I've heard of that man. He's highly respected. Mr. Galton, I want him to come work for me at once. We can't waste a minute. Yes, sir. if you are not covered up. At Fort Mandan, Lewis and Clark discovered an amazing woman. Captain Lewis, I've discovered that there's a remarkable native woman here who was taken from a tribe that lives very near the mountains. Hmm, if you're right, Captain Clark, the tribe could provide us with horses to cross the Rocky Mountains. Well, there is a slight problem, Captain Lewis. What is it? Well, she's about to give birth to a baby any day now. We will just have to bring the baby along with us. 
I'm not sure the men will appreciate having a baby along. Well, we just have to, look. We just have to get used to it. And besides, having a woman and children along will we'll tell all the other tribes that we come in peace. No more parties ever going around women and children. Oh, how I missed my 
Lewis and Clark crossed the Rocky Mountains in 1805 and reached the Pacific Ocean on November 1805. Then they traveled back to St. Louis in 1806. When they arrived home, every, they read, everyone read their journals and said, Let's go to Oregon! The first to come are fur trappers. Let me introduce you to one of the most famous early settlers, Dr. John McLaughlin. Dr. John McLaughlin was a very tall man and had totally white hair. Dr. John McLaughlin, what have you brought for me? I only buy the best birds, no matter what they be. Beaver pets, my cats are fat, so open up the trunk. But you just must walk away if you put me a skunk. Oh, but you just must walk away if you put me a skunk. Yeah! John McLaughlin. I'm the head of the Hudson Bay Company for this region. At first I lived in Fort Vancouver, but then I moved to Oregon City. Fur traders come to me with lots of different furs, and I sell them to England where they are highly prized. Dr. McLaughlin, here are some elk hides. Ed, good. You can make lots of things from elk. And here are some raccoon pills. Okay, but raccoon is not very valuable. Still, you can make good hats from raccoon. And what do you have? Yeah. Dr. McLaughlin, I washed this gun for and I don't think it smells too bad. Yes, it does. I don't think we can use that. <laughs> and what else do you have? Beaver pelt. Three of them. Excellent. But you know, it's sad because the beaver is such an interesting animal. Especially in the way they build their dams. Beavers are always cutting down trees. Look at here in the Northwest. We have lots of trees, so we have lots of beavers. Thousands and thousands of people started to travel to Oregon in covered wagons. They were moving to Oregon to start farms. You see, the land in the Willamette Valley is very good farmland. They usually start in Independence and Syrian Spring made to Oregon in October or November. And they usually traveled over 2,000 miles, usually walking beside their oxen. The, the wagons are pulled by oxen, the kids are do all sorts of chores. Like helping take care of the oxen. We had to feed them, wash all their stuff, and here they come now.
to and fro, then go back in do see Form a circle, show your charm, now join partners arm in arm. One woman wrote in her journal, Last night my clothes got out of the wagon and the oxen ate them up. <laughs> Boring, Oregon. You mean there's a town named Boring? Yes, 
and there are other towns that were interesting names. Well, maybe you should do a little research project on names of Oregon towns. Later that day, the girls took out a map of Oregon and were surprised to see some very interesting names. Tabitha, listen to this. There is Bend, Oregon. It is named after a bend in the river. And there is Drain, Oregon, and a town named Riddle. So, Chloe and Carol, how's your project going? Where to the far... Our team is way ahead to the part where... How our capital Portland got its name. Whoa! Portland is not the state capital. Well, it is the biggest city, isn't it? But that doesn't mean it's the state capital. The capital is Salem. <laughs> Many times the capital isn't the biggest city in the state. <laughs> That's right. And speaking about states, I think we now have a skit about the day Oregon officially became a state. Michaela and Ellie? Depression. And times were very hard. 
So logging companies were happy if they had a job and kept working even when they told them what to say. Today, August 14, 1933, you may cut trees only in the early morning when it's cool. The danger of the fire is just too great. Yes, we understand. But they didn't obey the forest ranger. Come on, man. It's one o'clock in the afternoon. We'll work till five tonight. We need the money. And soon something terrible happened. Oh no, there's smoke coming from that old cedar tree you're dragging. <coughs> the fire was started within seconds because the forest was so hot and dry, it got out of control. We can't put the fire out. Get out, fast! The fire spread and spread for 11 days to burn out of control. It burned huge areas of the coast range. When it was finally put out, over 300,000 acres or over 12 million trees were destroyed. Also, millions of animals were killed. This was a huge loss and so pointless. Douglas fights where the waters cut through Down her wealth 
Nick, Natang, and Amir showed us that there is often more than one point of view when we study history. They had a very different presentation about the dams. They will give us the perspective from the viewpoint of the Native Americans. When the dams were built, the water backed up over the Great Falls of Columbia where the Native Americans had fished for thousands of years. Well, the dams brought electric power and jobs to Oregon to change the way of life for our tribes forever. This is a drawing of the Great Falls that used to be on the Columbia River by the Dallas. They were called the Salilo Falls. Often there would be great festivals on the bank of the river. Tribes from all over the west coast would travel hundreds of miles each year to attend the celebrations. There's a huge trading market near the falls. But now the falls are gone. When, when the dams were built, the water acted up and covered the falls. By 1960, there were no more festivals. The salmon no longer jumped the falls. <laughs> Lewis and Clark came in 1805. Less than 200 years, the white men had destroyed with their treasure for thousands of years. It was extremely sad for our people. is a very friendly state, but unfortunately, it hasn't always been friendly to minorities. When Oregon became a state in 1859, they didn't permit slavery, but then the legislature passed law forbidding Africans and Americans to move here. The Chinese and Japanese people in, in, the, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, the Chinese and Japanese people did not have the same rights as whites. Oregon was also one of the last states to give women the right to vote. And in the 1950s, many signs that said whites only could be seen in restaurants and theaters in Portland. But in the 1960s, a lot of things changed in our country. People protested and the laws were changed. There are many songs written during that time about freedom and justice. Here is one of them.
Oregonians have always been concerned about the environment. After all, this is a beautiful state, and we would like to preserve it. We learned how to recycle bottles and cans long before most other states figured it out. Laws were passed that made sure beaches would be protected and always available for the public. Every year, thousands of people help clean up our beaches. So let's have a beach party.
explain to Miss Foote. Now, let's see who hasn't finished their report yet. Chloe? Miss Foote, my dog Fido ate our report last night. We just finished page 352. Honestly! Chloe, you really expect me to leave that old excuse? Hmm. Let's see, that is the point. I heard that about 4,300 and... No, Miss Foote, her dog really ate her report. It's just not fair. Well, I'm sorry, but rules are rules. If you do not have a report to turn in today, you may not attend the party. Okay, everyone's finished except Carly and Tabitha. I believe you girls have something to present. Uh, yes we do, uh, don't we, Carly? Oh, yeah, we do. Okay, that's it. I'm going to have to give Mr. Pep a little call and have him come down here to hear the support. We'd like to tell you what Oregonians believe in. We have seen a lot of skits and presentations about historical events. But nobody has said what makes Oregon and Oregonian special. As Oregonians, we believe that our state is beautiful and that we must preserve it. We believe that we should treat all our citizens fairly and when we've caused someone an injury, we need to, to apologize and make it right. We believe that when someone in our state needs our help, we should help them. We believe that we are proud of our pioneer heritage and will continue to be pioneers inventing new and different ways of doing things. We believe that there should be quality public education for all. We believe that it is important to follow the law and that no one is above the law. We believe that it will probably rain in Oregon in the winter, but that we can make jokes about the rain, for we have a good sense of humor. And finally, we believe that, that this is, is the best place on
to offer some thank yous. Doing this show, there's absolutely positively no way we could ever do this show without an incredible crew. We had a wonderful, wonderful crew. This and they are in the names are in your program. But I want to especially thank a few people. I'm going to put these down for a second. Um, because we've had some just amazing help. And I would love the, the parents, and even if they think they're working on the costumes right now, and they're getting them ready, if they could come out here, because we really, really would like to acknowledge them. First of all, if we could have the costume group come out. So Mo and Tracy and Marissa, and of course, Kitty is backstage, Susan Finch, who did so much work on it, and Nancy, and I probably missed somebody else. If you worked on costumes, Absolutely wonderful people. Jennifer, where are you? Are you out in the audience who did the can can? And is Tracy around who did the beach and the oh rats who did the, the beach and the, the cowboy dance? And also um, James, if you're around, if you could give them applause. So thank you so much. parents who helped out um, this beautiful program produced by Karen and Susan, the wonderful poster out in the hall, and I won't get your name right, but I think it's Micah, thank you, and um, Susan for helping out with communications, and then this really, really wonderful thing happened, excuse me guys, you can stay put for just a sec, um, because I don't normally get stage lights at a school show like this. But they made a huge, huge difference. And Michael came back out of retirement. <laughs> Folks, we could not do this show without the support of the classroom teachers as well. And so would you please acknowledge Mrs. Oliver and Mr. Harrison. class is that they sing and they're very theatrical. And singing in very theatrical class is also one that tends tends to have a lot of energy. <laughs> as you know. But they really do sing well and I hope that a lot of the parents here will keep those kids singing, especially in choirs. We have some amazing voices this year. This is one of the greatest classes I've ever had for voices. So I really
You will walk off quietly, get your costumes changed. Audience, you will excuse me. Audience, you will meet them after the costumes are changed. So, of course, could you stay in place for one more minute?